Merci. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Scott Lobdell. He's a software engineer at HSA Social, who's recently left the Army and is going to talk about this big blimp here. So give it up. Jeremiah, how, how, how much did you tie this thing? So this is a presentation about blimp, so I, I did want to get this started off right. So bear with me for just one moment, please. All right. It's not hydrogen, though. So that was good. I was going to inhale it. It was going to be really awesome. Uh, anyway, just a little bit about me. My name is Scott Lobdell. Left the Army. I work for Hearsay Social now. Uh, I do have some resources for this talk. Uh, I did present, or I have them posted at the end of the slideshow. But otherwise, if you just follow me on Twitter, I have the resources posted online. You can follow along if you want. Um, if I can also just put in a brief plug, Hearsay Social is going to be hosting the Blimp After Party, the Deerja Party, if you will, directly after this at the, the West End in the, uh, the reserve room, right? A lot of big names are going to be there. Akshay Shaw is going to be there for any fans of, uh, of him and his work. So without further ado, let me just go ahead and get into the blimp here. So uh, what this is, it's a semi-autonomous blimp. So the idea is that I can, instead of piloting this thing directly, I can click waypoints on a map. The blimp will navigate to. And my own goal for this was to do aerial photography. Uh, so the idea behind this here is that if any of you want to replicate any or all of this project, this should give you enough resources to get started and to avoid some of the same pitfalls that I had. So the overall architecture that we have here is we have a laptop uh, that has a client application that's in Python. Everything is in Python. I'm even wearing Python skin boots. No big deal. Um, so we've got an Xbox remote. It's wired to a laptop that we can control. That Xbox remote sends commands that are, that are encoded into specialized byte commands that I wrote. They're sent across the wire, a wireless XB connection, which I'll get into. Uh, that then connects to the onboard controller here in the blimp, which is actually a full-blown computer running Ubuntu 10.4. That, in turn, sends commands to the rotor. So with any basic aircraft, I know Ned just had a previous talk about helicopters, but your basic controls are pitch, roll, and yaw. So pitch, of course, controls the nose of the aircraft. Roll is going to be your side to side. And then yaw is going to be your, your compass azimuth here. So if we have a blimp, then we have those same controls. And we just manipulate pitch, roll, and yaw in different manners. So for pitch, we essentially manipulate the tail, uh, the tail elevator um, to, to apply force as a result of the wind, and then we can also manipulate the thrust vector on the gondola to control the direction of the rotors. As far as roll goes, blimp is, a blimp is naturally, um, it has a very, center, a very heavy center of gravity, so it's going to naturally roll to your, your normal position. So you really only need to worry about pitch and yaw. Then of course with yaw you could just control the tail rudder, and then you can go left or right. So the idea behind the autopilot algorithm, or how this goes about working, is I only care about pitch and yaw, so I, have, I need to establish a target pitch and a target yaw. So the target pitch is established based on your current altitude and your target altitude, and that tells you whether you want to pitch up or down. And then for yaw, you have your current azimuth, and then you have your target azimuth, which is based on GPS coordinates. So with both of those things, you can easily determine, do I need to go up or down, and do I need to turn left or right? So from there, you have the intensity of how hard you want to turn or how hard you want to pitch. And that's based on the differential between those two. So it's directly proportional to the relative, di relative distance between those two things. All right. So here's the overall so software architecture behind what we have. So we have a controller, which is responsible for managing all of these different uh, asynchronous tasks. And I just say task because I actually use gevent here. So this isn't a talk about gevent, uh, but gevent itself is emulated, emulated multi-threading. So it's not actually multi-threaded. You have what's called greenlets here. And so how this works is essentially you spawn multiple greenlets. And as soon as you create those, they're kicked off asynchronously. And once you get down to that join all, that's going to block until each of those different greenlets uh, finishes its task. So in this case, case, each one of those individual greenlets was an infinite loop, so it didn't have to do that. Um, we can also do monkey patching, which will take anything that naturally blocks. So in this case, we have a serial connection, for example. So anytime anything is blocking, it's going to immediately yield to another thread. So that's also going to make it when we do time.sleep. So if, you, if you, in that bottom 
bottom example, we have the sample greenlet, and that's the basic structure of every single greenlet that we have. We're going to do something, we're going to do a little thing, and then we're going to sleep, which is going to yield to the other threads, and then once that sleeping is complete, it's going to be reactivated. All right, so uh, the very first thing we have to do is we have to read from sensors. So uh, the, the sensors themselves had sample code written in C++, and that's really the easiest way to interface with them. So the basic premise behind what I did is I took the things that I had to write in C++, or the things that needed to be particularly fast, and then I bubbled up the high-level uh, abstractions to Python. And then with Python, it's very easy to kind of create an autopilot algorithm here. So again, this isn't a talk about boost either, but here's the basic premise. We have, a, we have some things that we want to do in C++, and then we want to create a manager class for those different things, and then we want to surface some of those functions up to Python. So here in this example, if you look at the very bottom, we're surfacing up the, uh, the functions say hello and get integer, and then the bottom is just how you would go about using that in Python. So what this means for us then is that we can create these, these drivers that we write in C++, and then here I just surface this one function up to Python, just get azimuth. So here, Python is going to call C++ code. So we, that was the example for the compass. So now we can go and do that with every single one of our, of our sensors. So in this case, I have a GPS, accelerometer, compass, and, and an altimeter. So for all of those things, I have drivers written in C++. I surface those functions up to Python. And then I have a sensor manager that manages all of those things. And the controller is then going to pull the sensor manager every one-tenth of a second. And as it gets those values, it then updates and communicates with the other greenlets and tells them about the update. So in this case, we're going to tell the, the communicator about it, which will send the data back to the client uh, with you know, what, what my current GPS is, what my altitude is, everything else. And it's going to send it to the autopilot. So the autopilot relies on the sensor data in order to think and, and decide what to do next. So. With the camera, this is the exact same concept again. I used Boost, and the reason I did it here in this case is because I relied on a C++ library called GPhoto2. And so what that is, it's a, a camera library written in C++ that supports hundreds and hundreds of cameras that you can then take pictures with them, you can get the live view. Um, and in my case, I had a Canon T2i. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to be able to grab a frame from the live view, and I wanted to be able to take a picture remotely. Uh, and this is all done through the USB or a USB connection. Um, and then I could just surface those functions to Python, and then I could take pictures from there. So in order to communicate from the client to the blimp, I use an XB module. And what this is, it's basically, if you can imagine just a really, really long serial cable, and that's basically what this is, if, if you just think of that abstraction. Uh, but it's a wireless module that uses the 802.15.4 protocol, which is just a peer-to-peer low power uh, protocol. And then here I use Pi Serial to interface with it. So I can just dynamically find where, where the serial port is loaded or the XP module is loaded. I can open it and then I can write to it and read from it. And I'm going to do both of those things from the writer and the reader. So in this case, I developed my own sort of communications protocol, which I'm sure a lot of you uh, could probably imagine that there's better ways to do this, but it worked for me. But the basic pattern was that I send, uh, I send a command and a value. And so the value, what the value means is dependent on the command that's sent before it. So here, this is all I'm doing. I'm sending a command and a value. I'm, I'm packing those values in Python into just two bytes for a short, for instance, or uh, eight bytes, I believe, for a float. Um, and what I'm doing as well is I'm adding header, byte, header bytes so that I can designate a packet. So if, if there's any sort of packet loss, I need to be able to reestablish that stream and determine what's the command and what's the value. So in this case, I just had some reserved bytes of 254 and 255, and that pattern only appeared in the header bytes. So that way, I was able to designate what's a packet. So on the receiving end, I have a, I have a reader and a writer on both the controller and the client. And so all this is just doing is just interpreting that stream and do, taking the appropriate action. So the basic pattern is up here. I have a dictionary that has the command and then the appropriate function that it ma maps to. And then it's going to call that function as soon as it gets the command, and it's going to pass in the value that we got. So this is just one example. In this case, this is the, uh, the control that I use with, from the Xbox. So if I press a button, it's going to say, hey, there's a button pressed. The value is going to be the button that was pressed, and then it's going to take the appropriate action. So down there at the bottom, you can see start issued the kill can command, up would increase the target altitude, and so forth. All right. So 
To actually control the blimp, I made another abstraction where we have a class strictly responsible for managing the motors. And one thing that I did here that proved to be very valuable was to make it so that the inputs were basically enumerated data types. Um, and this meant I could send commands just like pitch up, pitch down with an associated value. And what this allowed me to do, is it allowed me to independently, independently validate the autopilot in the motor control. So essentially, I could do manual control and send commands like pitch up, pitch down, validated the work properly. And then with the autopilot, I could essentially validate, hey, depending on the action I take, am I outputting uh, pitch up or pitch down here? So this has two, two major functions that are exposed to the controller. So we have tick. So every one-tenth of a second, it's going to tick and re recalculate what the motors are supposed to do next, and then basically update from instructions. So we have other classes that are updating the information here, which is a pretty good pattern to use. It's uh, tell, don't ask. So here is the illustration of that pattern here. I have the autopilot and the manual control that both subclass a base class. And that base pilot has uh, a think and a get instruction. So whether you're using the manual control or the autopilot, you can get the instructions from them. But they're both updated in their own respective manner. So the autopilot will take input from uh, some things from the Xbox control or the client, you can essentially say, like, increase the altitude or decrease the altitude, uh, send in this GPS coordinate. But primarily, we're going to use the sensor, sensors in this case. So based on the sensor data, we're going to respond accordingly. And then with manual control, this is based, uh, this uses purely um, the Xbox control in this case, which is hooked up to the laptop and custom commands are sent across. So here's some sample code from the manual control here. The two public functions I mentioned were think and get, a, get in instructions. It's updated. Uh, it's updated in its own way, so set right th thumbstick horizontal in this case. So as you send it commands, it's going to update what values it's supposed to, supposed to do. And then for the autopilot, it's basically the same pattern, but we're just updating from the sensors, as you can see here. So this is the, the sample code for the yaw. There's a lot more that goes into this, but in this case, this was um, how to calculate yawing left or yawing right and the associated intensity based on the current azimuth and the target azimuth. Um, so this is kind of interesting, actually, because if you imagine with uh, pitch, this pattern works just fine because you have naturally opposing forces. So you have gravity that's going to naturally slow it down as you pitch up, for example. With yaw, there's no counter, there's no opposing forces as you do this. So in this case, what I actually did is rather than start, establish a target position, I established a target velocity. So you can imagine we're getting into some derivatives there. And as you're yawing left or yawing right, you're manipulating acceleration to affect velocity here. Um, and so as you imagine then, we could start yawing left, and as we approach our position, we're going to realize that we're going too fast, and you can imagine that we're applying counter forces as we get to that point. All right. For the hardware architecture, oh, I'm sorry. For the client application here, we're just running a laptop, and the point of the laptop is to be able to set waypoints. So here I just have some video that's just illustrating that point. The circle represents the radius of how far we can communicate with the blimp. So it's a one mile radius. So this is two miles across and two miles high. And you could click any point within that range. And these XB modules are supposed to be one mile line of sight connectivity. All right, and then so from here, I also use the Google Maps API, and that returns a PNG. And then I use OpenCV to go ahead and render that PNG onto a GUI. And then I wrote some other stuff on there and took mouse input and things like that. With the Xbox control, I again use Boost. And here I use another C++ library, which was SDL. And again, I just surfaced those high level, high level um, things that we care about to Python, which then took care of everything else. So, oh, bummer, I didn't hook up the sound. So here's the, the actual maiden flight. So what I did is I had this theory that if I could take, make the sensors work in concert and manipulate the servos and everything, then <laughs> we could go ahead and uh, t make a test platform and then just change the autopilot algorithm. But as you saw, that actually didn't work because I had, had a big center of gravity problem. And at that point, I decided to just go ahead and shift to the blimp. So now for our hardware. Uh, to preempt some questions I'm sure a lot of people might have, why didn't I use a Raspberry Pi? The honest answer is that when I was putting this together, I didn't really know enough about it. And just after some Googling, I found this single board computer. Uh, Roboard RB110, which is excellent hardware, but it wasn't very well documented. Uh, but a few advantages it had, had over the Raspberry Pi to begin with. Uh, there's variable voltages. I think it supports anywhere from 6 to 24 volts input. Um, 
and you can connect servos directly, you can connect I2C directly. And then here's just some of the, you can see some of the other sensors that I use, which I already talked about. But we had the accelerometer, accelerometer and the compass. Um, we had, which we used the accelerometer to, to find out what the pitch roll in yaw was. The altimeter was a, a temperature, pressure, and humidity sensor that could then calculate a relative altitude uh, based on a zeroized, uh, zeroized altitude as soon as you started the, the application. All right, so the, the most difficult part of this project was independently validating everything. So with a blimp especially, we have something that's very large, it's very costly to inflate it, so this is about $100 worth of helium. Uh, so if we could validate everything independently and then bring them together, that was a much better, option, better thing to do. So on the top left, that's an example of automated pitch control. So you can see that as I'm manipulating the gondola, it's the sensors are responding appropriately and telling the servos to manipulate the thrust vector. And then the center image is just me actually doing that with the full-blown blimp. So the rest of the videos, top right, I'm yawing left and right. Um, Bottom left, I am manipulating a servo to change the thrust vector. And on the bottom right, I am just changing the motor control to actually speed up or speed down. So uh, this demo was pretty wild. I worked a lot. So I didn't actually build any of the hardware here. I didn't build the blimp. I just did the software portion of it. And I was working with a guy in San Diego from a company called eBlimp. And I went down with him and worked on this project together. And of course, testing right here, what we actually filmed wasn't the best of conditions. I got down there in this little small park, and the guy told me, like, all right, you got power lines here, and you got a freeway there, so good luck. Um, <laughs> so that was a little frightening, because when we, we, we have this blimp, which, if the motors are on, is just going to fly away, and it's optimized for a prolonged airtime. So this is quite scary because if there was some sort of exception that I didn't account for, the motors would just keep spinning and it would just go off into the distance. So I actually bit, did add some uh, safety mechanisms in there, which actually proved to be very vital. So for example, if it doesn't receive communication for five seconds, it'll go ahead and pitch down and then kill the motor. So that actually proved to be invaluable because the very first time I did manual testing, it was the other guy that flew it. and. Uh, I did, in fact, make a mistake, long story short. And he flew it up and then got a little excited, and he ripped the Xbox control out, and then so it just flew away. So five seconds later, it came back down, though, onto a roof. Had to go get that, but don't worry, it was good. So the blimp itself is not actually lighter than air. It's about 95% buoyant. So as you can see right here, it does just rest on something. Um, but creating lift is very easy. And as you're moving forward, the blimp itself acts like a wing. So uh, some of the biggest pitfalls that I had. So ironically, the most challenging part of this project was getting Linux installed onto the single board computer. So there's limited RAM to begin with, so you can't just install from a CD. So there's 256 megabytes RAM. Um, and you also have to install a custom kernel because there's a specialized chipset here. So if you do want to use this hardware, I do have resources that I put on my blog. So I actually have a working Ubuntu 10.4 image that you could just copy onto an SD card and get this working immediately. Um, another problem I had was the initial setup of Boost. Uh, for any Python programmers, I would really recommend that you just do a Hello World program with Boost, because as you do that, it's really going to open some doors to some libraries that you wouldn't otherwise be able to use. So if you know in your back pocket that you can use any C++ library that you want, um, it's very useful to know how to use Boost. And if you get that make file working once, um, and in my case, I ran into some issues because the version of Python on my path was different from the Python headers that I had compiled against, and it took me a long time to figure out that that problem was going on. So another challenge here was that the, the communication mechanism I, I'm using, as I mentioned, is an XP module. So that's a serial connection. So you're sending commands linearly, and it's interpreting them linearly. So not only is, is that somewhat slow, um, but you, there's also not much throughput. So the autopilot itself actually flew way better than I can because, the, I mean, the response time from a human is much slower than just onboard calculations and recalculations and uh, creating a response. So another big problem was 
properly reading the altimeter. So as I mentioned, the altimeter that I have was a pressure, temperature, and humidity sensor. And so the problem there is that a gust of wind will then affect both the pressure and the temperature, and the result is that the altitude reading will change. So essentially, if a gust of wind is going it, it comes and hits the blimp, it's going to think, oh, I'm at a different altitude, so I need a pitch. So a gust of wind would cause the thing to basically pitch at random, which would then push the blink, blimp back. So I went ahead and switched to GPS, and apparently you have the same problem. So the GPS still gives fluctuating readings for altitude, which would then cause this thing to pitch up and down at random. So um, I guess with, with GPS satellites, it's easy to triangulate the X and Y because satellites are spread apart, but I guess the Z axis is a little more challenging because you can't do that same kind of triangulation. Uh, so I learned about that, so I haven't entirely solved that problem. Um, and then beyond that, it's just a matter of accounting for the wind. Because any problem that you have, like the, the pitching problem that I mentioned, or the yawing problem that I mentioned initially, where it would constantly, like, I started out by using position, so it would constantly overshoot the yawing because of an absence of any sort of counteracting force. So when you bring the wind into the picture, that's going to exacerbate any flaws that you actually have. So those were some of the biggest pitfalls. All right, so I, I do need to go ahead and give some credit where credit is due here. So uh, as I said, I worked with a guy named Larry Fleming from eblimp.com. He was a hardware guy, so it was really luxurious to have him as part of this. Uh, Roger, who is one of my coworkers, and he was amazing with Linux. He was the only reason I was able to get it installed on the board. Um, and then I also got a little help from a guy from ericam.com. So uh, if you want to get any of these resources, I have all of the parts lists, so everything that I used. I have sample code in Python for every single module. Um, and I have, I have like the, the laser cut design for the acrylic piece that I used to mount the board and all of the screws and everything associated with that. The working rowboard image that's running Ubuntu 10.4. If you want to contact me, uh, there's my email. And once again, we had the blimp after party across the street at the West End. So you can come find us there. So that, that actually brings us to a close, if I can take any questions. Yeah, um, if you were moving this to like an inside area where you didn't have GPS, have you kind of thought about how you could get like a 3D representation of its location on an internal space? So there are systems to solve that problem, and I don't know much about them, but I do know that they're very expensive. So okay. you have something that like basically represents a GPS. So you, I, th I, I really couldn't answer that with confidence, awesome. you but you have something that you mount on the ceiling, yeah. and then you can triangulate a position. Um, but yeah, I mean, th that's, that's kind of a problem. You can only use the GPS outdoors, and even then it takes a little while to get a fix. Thank you. Good talk. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Guten Tag. My name is Otto von Bismarck. Uh, I want to salute you for your excellent work here. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. The only question I have is why didn't you pick helium? It, uh, why did you pick helium? Why didn't you pick hydrogen? <laughs> that is the way to so, do this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually, well, I, the answer is that I did, uh, but I thought people might not like it if I had this hydrogen filled blimp in here. And then, of course, uh, my company has graciously sp you know, sponsored my efforts at this point, um, and they are actually paying for the helium. If it were just me, I would use hydrogen. Um, and I actually did take the time to manufacture my own hydrogen using electrolysis, uh, but I ended up that was not very easy at all. So the math is basically that one amp hour will generate 0.41 liters of hydrogen. So that's the first problem, is that it's not very efficient. And then beyond that, to actually get that amperage with electrolysis is very difficult. So I actually made this little contraption with carbon graphite electrodes, I uh, put p potassium hydroxide in the water. The, the graphite made it so the metal wasn't part of the reaction, um, but then the, the resistance of the water was still very, very high, even with a really large power supply. So I could only generate a small amount of hydrogen, and then once you got to that point, uh, you had a gas that wasn't pressurized, so it was very difficult to manipulate. So at that point, I just had some hydrogen, I blew it up, and uh, burned my finger, and that's what I did with that. What's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, following off of what you said a little bit, do you have any tips on how to convince your company to purchase one of these? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
No, well, here, I, so the story behind this is that I actually started this project before I joined my company. Um, so my initial goal was to do aerial photography. So I basically wanted to build a Django application that housed a bunch of pictures and automated when the, like building a calendar view based on when the picture was taken, extracted from the EXIF data. And I wanted to just go to public places and take pictures and have the domain name on the blimp and sell those and whatever. But then I stopped working once I got to my company because then I had to do real work. Uh, so if you, if you get a PyCon talk or something claiming to have a blimp, then they'll help you. So that's, that's a thought. Sounds great. Yeah. I had a similar question to the first one, which is that, you know, I, I guess, do you know if the um, cell tower location signal contains its height? And if it does, could you triangulate from that? So, so you're saying basically get a better GPS signal by using, doing the same thing that cell phones well, do and we'll triangulate? Replace your height data with cellular, you know, triangulation. Yeah, that would certainly be a better way to do it. Uh, there definitely was a cost of time in getting this done. Right. So, um, yeah, that would certainly be a better solution, uh, but I did not do it in oh, short. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you found a solution to the, the problem of the wind and the pressure changing. I was thinking maybe S just capping like how fast you, you would expect it to change and then waiting for it to So, there, I mean, there's a few different things to do with that. I haven't exactly f figured out what to try next. I, the point is I haven't really been able to test it yet. I've really actually been doing a a lot of preparation for just coming here. Uh, but a few ideas I had were to, for instance, take the average altitude reading over the past second and then use that. Another example would be to go ahead and assume that I can maintain an altitude. Like, so once I reach it, then stop, stop reading for a little bit until I change the target altitude again. Um, so there's a few ideas that I'd like to play with. I just haven't gotten a chance to actually test it yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, awesome talk. Um, do you have any experience with uh, any other like uh, drone uh, platforms, like uh, some of the, let's say, 3D robotics autopilot systems or anything like that? Did you choose to go with like a like a you know a full Linux computer instead of using that for a specific reason? Yeah, I, I guess I mean part of uh, I don't know enough about it. Like I know, I mean the the short answer is that no, I didn't do that. I didn't really look into it much. Um, I kind of felt confident in just writing my own. But for instance, I know like. Typically, with these autopilot projects, you would use an Arduino. Uh, but I know, like, an Ar I, and I don't know much about it, but I know that there are limitations with them. So I know, like, Arduinos, for instance, don't have a lot of RAM. So you actually have to be conscious of that while you're coding. Um, whereas here, with my system, I really don't even have to worry about that because I'm actually just running a full blown version of Ubuntu. Great. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Um, First off, this is pretty sweet. Um, I'm kind of sad it doesn't drive in here, but. <laughs> What's that? I'm, I'm kind of sad it doesn't drive in here. That'd be pretty nice. Oh, yeah, I wanted to put a saddle on top and just you know ride it around. But it only has an eight pound payload in this case. So um, I'm a little too heavy. But what I was going to ask is, uh, how optimistic would you be about trying to make something like this run off an Android phone? Uh, yeah, so that actually was a fairly common question with the people that I was working with. Uh, like, honestly, I don't know enough about how to how to communicate between the phone and the controller, or I don't know how to, like, what the best way is to go about doing that. Um, and in this case, I just got these XP modules, which I think total cost like $70. So that was just the choice I went with. Okay. And it's nice if your phone doesn't go flying away on you. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great talk. A um, oh, couple of questions. What was the total cost, and how long did it actually take you to do this? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. The cost, it's, okay, so the cost of building it was much, so, okay, so the blimp itself is several thousand dollars, and you can get these from, uh, I get it from eblimp.com, basically, depending on the size that's going to affect how much it is, but the magnitude is several thousand dollars. The hardware that I bought all cost less than a thousand, which is actually much cheaper than if you were to go with like an analog solution. So like I know there are some systems to like record video, aerial video or whatever with purely analog systems. I think there's some power draw problems as well, where they draw more power. But short answer, yeah, about less than a thousand dollars. The helium itself, uh, it, in total about two hundred fifty dollars for three hundred cubic feet, which fills this up twice. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I started this project over a year ago, put it on hold for a while, and then for the past few months, I've been spending, um, I mean, a bit uh, short, probably about three months total, like seriously working on it. Okay, I guess I'm out of time. So thank you very much.
Oh, thank you.